Peace is God's will. It is a gift of His love to us. Our faith unwraps this gift, and it is experienced in tangible ways. The peace of God is a real experience within our lives, made available to us, and we unwrap that by faith. Jesus said that if you'll believe, anything can be done for Him that believes. Anything can be done. Uh, There are three givers of peace. The Father gives peace, the Son gives peace, and the Holy Spirit gives peace. There are two gifts of peace, peace with God and the peace of God, and there's one evidence of peace, that is the fruit of the Spirit. So we're going to see those things here this morning. First of all, uh, in the Greek, I cannot say that word, (laughs) but in the Greek, it's peace between individuals, harmony, and it's not merely the absence of trouble, but it can be the calm in the midst of the storm. The Hebrew word is the word shalom that we understand well in English that means peace, completeness, prosperity, welfare. We can't completely understand God's peace with our minds because we're told that it surpasses understanding. Philippians 4.7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in in Christ Jesus. We're not going to cover the whole subject of peace. You're going you're to see big holes. You're going to say, why didn't pastor say that? Why didn't pastor cover that? Well, it's because the peace of God is beyond understanding. We cannot comprehend the peace of God. How do you like that for a big subject? I, I like to wrap my mind around things. That's one of the things that maybe I struggle with a little too much. I want to understand things. I want things to fit together and piece together. You know, I want it to be like a hand in a glove experience where it all makes sense. Maybe that's just because I'm so American. I don't know. I I just like things fitting together. But on the subject of peace, a lot of times it just doesn't make sense. And we're not talking about manufactured peace here. Walking around with a smile, but on the inside being all tore up. We're talking about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I don't know why I'm at peace, but I am at peace. There are maybe many different kinds of peace because it's beyond understanding. But we're going to look at specifically two different kinds of peace this morning. Peace with God and the peace of God. It's the same peace, but they're different. Peace with God is different than the peace of God within our lives. Peace is God's will for all people who will receive it. Jesus is God's olive branch of peace extended to all men. When the uh, angels appeared to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, the Bible says, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Jesus is God's peace sent to earth. Now really, I don't want to step on too much tradition here, but I'm going to. Because uh, the, it's a poor translation that says, peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's bad translating. Okay, if you study what this passage says, it doesn't say peace on earth, goodwill to men. It says on earth, peace and goodwill to men. Well, you say, Pastor, why does it matter? Doesn't it really say peace on earth, goodwill to men? No, it says on earth, peace, goodwill to men. And understanding this will help clear up some of the confusion of Jesus' first coming. Jesus did not come to bring peace upon the earth. a matter of fact, I'll tell you where another passage is that Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. So how can God announce that Jesus came to bring peace on the earth? Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. How is it that God said that He was sending His peace to earth, and yet Jesus said He didn't bring peace on earth? Do not think that I came to bring peace on, peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake 
will find it. So how does this work? How is it that we're told these things like Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that God is telling us that uh, at the birth of Christ, through the pronunciation of angels, that God is, is sending peace. And yet Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. Have you ever wondered how things fit together? Like I said, I like things to fit together. I don't like reading over here, peace on earth, or peace, you know, peace to men. And over here reading, I, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. How do these things fit together? Well, there is a way that they fit together, actually. And it's simply this, that Jesus himself is God's peace to men. The Bible says in other place that he himself is our peace. That Jesus himself is our peace. So the pronunciation of the angels to the shepherds was not that wars are going to stop and a global government's going to be set up and no one's going to be hungry and no one's going to you know, uh, be abused. And That was not what the pronunciation was. What the angels were announcing concerning Jesus' first coming is that God is sending a gift of peace to this earth and his name is Jesus. Again, this is where it's important to understand peace with God versus the peace of God. In this context, we're talking about peace with God. God sent the gift of Jesus to be peace with Him. Jesus is the olive branch of peace. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, peace was made between God and the human race. Remember all those times we talked in the book of Romans about how the human race was at war with God? Because of Adam's sin, Adam is the corporal head of the human race. Adam was declared by God the leader of the human race. The leader of the human race sinned against God and declared war on God is what happened. What God did in the sending of Jesus was he sent the olive branch of his peace. God said, I'm not angry anymore. God said, the anger is stilled. The anger is done away with. The war between humanity and me doesn't have to go on anymore. Here is my olive branch of peace. His name is Jesus. So when the angels declared peace on earth, they weren't declaring that the wars would cease and the rumors of war would cease because we see Jesus telling us something very different than that. Jesus actually says that before His second coming, there's going to be an increase in wars and rumors of war and pestilence and earthquakes and things in various places. His second coming, when He returns again to set up His earthly kingdom and to rule and reign physically upon the earth, then He will establish worldwide peace. But right now, God's gift to man of, of His peace, of, of peace with God, is not a promise of, of all of the storms of life or all of the disagreements being settled. Does that make sense? This is peace with God. So the angels were able to pronounce peace on earth because peace literally did come to earth. Jesus Himself was that peace. Jesus Himself settled the matter. So as we put faith in Jesus, the account settled. We've got to trust in the finished work of Christ. That's grace, again, displaying itself. Today we're going to consider the three expressions of God's peace towards us. The first one comes from God the Father, uh, who, who makes peace with us. The second one comes from Jesus, who gives us His own peace. And the third one comes from the Holy Spirit, who provides evidences of the peace. So the first expression of God's peace towards us is peace with God through the Heavenly Father. If you want to turn to Romans 5 and, and follow along with some of these Scriptures, feel free to do that. You'll be familiar with these. So God's peace towards us is peace with the Father. Romans 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So world peace may be coming later, but through faith in Jesus, we now have peace with God. It's not something that we're waiting for in eternity. It's not something that we're waiting for peace with God when you get your life right. If you got faith in Jesus as your Savior, you have peace with God. This makes all the difference in the world. Understanding that Jesus is the Heavenly Father's expression of love towards us. Okay, If I think that God and I are having a fight, and I think that I'm in the wrong and God's clearly more powerful, what am I going to do? I'm going to run and hide, aren't I? But if I think that God Himself is offering, extending His hand like this and offering peace to me, and saying, hey, I understand... I understand your struggle. I'm making peace with you through Jesus Christ. An open hand is inviting me to come up and get help rather than run away. Now, some people, they think that when they sin, what's happening in heaven, because Jesus ever liveth to make intercession for us, right? 
And some people think that we sin, you know, we mess up. I did it again, darn it. And okay, Jesus, you got to intercede. So here's Jesus. He comes before the Father. Heavenly Father, please forgive them. I know that they're just dust and they're just human and they can't. They can't help themselves. And you got to give them a break, Heavenly Father. See, that's how Christians sometimes think that Jesus is interceding for us. But that's not what's happening. Jesus is the extension of God's peace to us. How Jesus is interceding is more like this. Heavenly Father, to punish them would be unjust because I took the penalty for their sin. Religion don't like that. I can feel it in the air. But I'm telling you, that's how Jesus intercedes. Jesus says, that was added to my account. If you make them pay for that, that would be unjust. Because I already paid for it. See, so the devil, when he accuses the brethren, Jesus isn't saying, well, yeah, I know, they got that sin problem. They got that, that attitude problem. They got, that's not how God is interceding for us. How he's interceding for us is he's saying, hey, I paid for that. Hello? <laughs> Why are you p- trying to pay the bill again? See, if you go into a restaurant and someone treats you to dinner and they pay the bill, and then you just, well, I just, I, I don't think that's right, so I'll pay the bill too, and I'll leave double. Well, that's stupid because somebody paid the bill for you. And if you walk to the counter, you're walking out the door, and the person at the cash register says, hey, you, pay your bill. You're a thief. Pay your bill. And If someone else steps in between you and the person at the register, are they going to say, oh, please forgive him. He's given to wayward ways. He does not pay his bill and he sure never tips. Have mercy on him. He's just human. That's not what's happening. When the person steps between them, they say, hey, I paid that bill. I paid that bill. Do you see the difference of intercession when we understand that Jesus himself is our peace? Jesus himself is God's peace extended to us. When God declared through the angels peace on earth, goodwill towards men, he was declaring that here's a package shipped from heaven. Here's a a gift that you can unwrap by faith and you don't have to be beaten up by the enemy anymore. Your sins and shortcomings won't set you at odds with me anymore. We're not at war anymore. We're at peace. Now, we can still sin against God. We can still transgress against God. And we're going to suffer a lot of natural consequences for sin. Because sin does have natural consequences, doesn't it? He made peace with God. I'm not at war with God. When I got a problem, I don't have to run and hide. I can run to the throne. I can run into Daddy's house and say, Lord, you better help me because I'm struggling here. And He will help us. Because I'm at peace with Him. The second expression of peace is a little different. See, that first one was peace with God. But in Jesus, we can have more than just peace with God. We can have the peace of Jesus Himself active within our lives. Let's look at a few scriptures here. First of all, John 14, 1. And they're on your paper if I rattle through them too quick for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. Listen to the wording of this. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus didn't say, I will not let your heart be troubled. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He's giving us a gift of an ability to say no. I choose not to worry about this situation. I choose not to be caught up in this drama. Not because of my own strength or power, but I choose by the grace and the power of Jesus Christ Himself to be at peace in these circumstances. It's a gift of peace. So the first gift was from Heavenly Father. It was Jesus Himself that we have peace between, uh, heaven, between God and man. And there's no war between us and God anymore, though the wars may continue on the earth. The second gift of peace is a peace for our personal lives where in the midst of any circumstance, we can be at peace. We can let not our hearts be troubled. We can make a choice to trust the grace of Jesus. John 16.33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This peace that Jesus is talking about is a gift to us, but it's not a guarantee to us. Listen to what I'm telling you. It's a gift to us, but it's not a guarantee to us. We have to choose to accept it and receive it by faith. God's a gentleman. And I don't care if you've 
I don't care if we're talking about a sinner that chooses to believe or not believe in Jesus, or if we're talking about a believer that chooses to walk in or not walk in the gifts that He gives. God does not force His stuff on anybody. He makes available to us an incredible peace, the peace of Jesus in the midst of any circumstance that we can by faith unwrap and experience. Now, here's really the clincher. Look at John 14, 27. My peace I leave with you. Before I finish that verse, listen to the context of this first. This is just before Jesus' betrayal, death, his crucifixion. And here they are. Some of them are still mixed up thinking that he's going to set up some earthly kingdom, which he's not doing at this point in the way they think he's doing it. You know, some of them, you know, th- there are people that are following Jesus for any number of reasons. Some are following him just because, hey, that dude can multiply fish and bread. <laughs> he said that. He said that to some of them. You're following me just because I know how to put the bread on the table. It's, it's a great gift of God that he feeds us but it's not why we follow Jesus uh, you know some of them are follow him you know because he healed me I got an obligation you know I just I need to be loyal to the guy that healed me amen that that's good true truth but maybe they're still misunderstanding his purposes why is there there's any number some of them aren't even loyal to him because you got Judas Iscariot in the bunch that's just waiting for an opportunity at this point to betray him You've got all this stuff happening. And you've got Jesus telling them, hey, by the way, guys, you've, you that are faithful to me, you've left everything, you've sacrificed everything for me. And by the way, I'm about to be handed over, betrayed, crucified. I'm about to die. They're trying to rebuke him. They're trying to say, no. But, you know, if you put it chronologically, the Scripture's in order. This is what's happening right here. And, and he's saying, Peter, you know, get behind me because you're not speaking the things of God. You're speaking the things of the devil. And... They just don't know what to think about this guy. He, I mean, they've seen him work these incredible miracles, and now he's saying, they're going to kill me. I'm going to let it happen. This is all going to... And, and they're just in utter confusion. And Jesus says, but I'm giving you a gift before I go. It's the gift of my peace. Really fathom the peace of Jesus. How Jesus was never shaken. He was never rattled. I know that he acted at times in holy indignation. That holy zeal filled his heart for the, for the kingdom of the Lord and the temple of the Lord. But that wasn't an agitation where he just lost his temper. That was a holy zeal that built up within him. Jesus was not shaken. Remember, they struck him on one cheek, he turned to the other cheek. They spit on him, they pushed the crown of thorns down into his head, and he stood silently, not saying a word. At peace. He was at peace. They were putting nails into his hands and feet on the cross. And the words from his mouth were, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was in complete calm in the midst of the most excruciating agony any person could ever go through. And Jesus is telling his disciples now, this same peace that you see displayed in my life, I'm giving you as a gift. Not the peace that the world gives. This is something completely different. This is my peace. Now, this is an important point because when I went online to make this PowerPoint and to pull up a few pictures for it and stuff, I typed in peace on Google Images, peace. And pictures of money popped up. Pictures of girls in bikinis popped up. Pictures of, uh, of ISIS cutting a head off people popped up. Everyone's got a different notion of what peace is, don't they? But everybody wants it. But they don't know what they're looking for. This is why the words of Jesus are so important to us. Now let's read it. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. This is an incredible gift. Okay, understand that this particular gift of peace flows directly from the person of Jesus to His children. 
I know that we're all about feeding the orphans and helping the homeless and stuff, but who gets the best gifts? Your kids get the best gifts. Let's be honest at Christmas time. Your kids get the best gifts. What Jesus left us as His children here is an incredible gift. I mean, this thing is incredible, expensive, beyond expensive. This thing is incalculable. When we understand a little bit, we can't totally understand the peace of God, but when we begin to understand a little bit of this gift that God gave us, the first one flows from Heavenly Father Himself. My son paid the price for you if you'll accept it. We're not at war. Come to me for help. Don't run from me and hide anymore. The second expression of this peace is from Jesus Christ Himself who paid that price for us. And He's saying, hey, in this world, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and settle that right now. You're going to have trouble in this world, but I'm giving you an incredible gift that the same peace that you've seen at work within my life by faith, you can unwrap that in your life. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if someone that you loved said, I'm going to give you an incredible gift this Christmas? You know, and you're thinking, well, what does incredible mean? And then you find out that they are a person of serious substance. And when they said incredible, they meant incredible incalculable. If you understand the person of Jesus, that Jesus on earth was God's peace to us. God's promise of peace to earth was Jesus. And if Jesus Himself was that peace, then how incalculable is that peace that He gives to us? I mean, imagine it. I, 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 these words fail me right now. I hope you understand me. These words are failing me right now. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Mine. I'm not just going to go out and get you something as a gift. I'm not just going to go look for the this blue light special. The thing that you have seen as a predominant trait within my life when they spit on me, when they rejected me, when they isolate me, when they nail me to a cross, when they defame my name, and yet in perfect peace, in perfect calm, I stood my ground. That's the same gift that I'm giving to you. See, God only gives gifts like that to His children. <laughs> That's a family gift. Amen? That's a family gift right there. And that's an incredible gift. It's His own peace. Those words ought to just burn, you know, they ought to just sear an image within our heart. My peace, my peace, I give to you. Well, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because uh, we're going to come back to that probably on the fifth Sunday and, you know, spend the whole time on that passage in Isaiah chapter 9. But it does say in Isaiah 9 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Why didn't Jesus have the title King of Peace? I believe that he will have that title when he sets up his earthly kingdom. But he has the title Prince of Peace. Because uh, I didn't have time to go through all those scriptures, but Heavenly Father is called the God of peace in the book of Hebrews. And uh, uh, Yehovah Shalom, God of peace, is how God, Heavenly Father, declared himself to Gideon before the defeat of the Midianites when they were terrorizing the people. And now here's Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Because you see, and Jesus said, my Father's greater than I. I don't want to get into a, a bunch of doctrine this morning that will take us off, off course here. Okay, as far as nature, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus. But let me just say, as far as in a time frame, a chronological time frame, Heavenly Father has put all things under Jesus' feet. We don't see the full manifestation of the kingdom yet. One day we will. One day he'll, we won't call Him. I, I don't know, but I think that one day we're not going to call Him Prince of Peace. We're going to call Him King of Peace. Because He's going to have an earthly kingdom. But right now, He's the Prince of Peace because the whole world, all the wars aren't going to stop yet. It's not over yet. They're going to continue for a while. But to His children, He's the Prince of Peace. And He gives us the gift of His peace. That's incredible. 
That is so incredible. I got to say one more thing on this, but I don't want to spend long on this because we'll come back to this one. From a peasant's perspective, I know we're not peasants. We're friends, heirs, co-heirs, joiners. But there are different vantage points. A servant's. From a servant's perspective, let's use the word servant. That's better. From a servant's perspective, does it matter if the prince or the king gave the decree? It really doesn't matter. The decree of a prince is just as good to a servant as the decree of a king because you're looking up to both of them. It, it won't work to tell the prince no any more than it'll work to tell the king no. Jesus is the prince of peace. And He gave us His very own peace. The prince of peace gave us His peace. Wow, it's just incredible stuff. We could, get, we could hang out there for a long time. The third expression of God's peace towards us is a tranquil lifestyle empowered by the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, was Jesus' gift of peace. If you read on in that passage that we just read, you'll see that the mechanism, I don't like that word, but the, the mode of God bringing that peace to us is the Holy Spirit. Jesus the Son issued the Holy Spirit to be present within the life of His children and to bring that peace. We unwrap it by faith, though. So a tranquil lifestyle empowered by the Holy Spirit uh, is an expression of God's peace towards us. Galatians 5.22 and 23, of course, talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Now listen to this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. We just did like a four-week study on the fruit of the Spirit. And I don't know why the Holy Spirit gives me things at the times He gives me things, but He's God. He has the right to do that. I don't know why God didn't give me this when we were doing that study. But while I was preparing for this, and, and I always pray over the messages, and I want them to be real in my life as much as I don't, I'm not just talking. I want, I want to experience the Word of God as I proclaim the Word of God. And I was praying over this, and I said, Lord, I just preached on four weeks of the fruit of the Spirit. And he said, I know. But he said, I want you to replace one word in that passage. Now listen to this. He said, I want you to replace the word fruit with the word evidence. Isn't the fruit the evidence? I'm not messing with the Word of God here. The fruit's the evidence, am I right? Listen to it when it, we read it that way. But the evidence of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. The evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. It's easy to talk a good talk, isn't it? When we're talking about peace, Jesus saying, my peace I give to you, the evidence of the Holy Spirit within our lives is the ability to be at peace in the midst of the storm. Do you remember, I don't, want to, I don't got time to turn over there, but just work with me here. Do you remember when uh, the disciples were in the boat and it was storming and the waves were crashing in and they said, Lord, wake up, you're asleep, we're going to drown. And we all feel like that sometimes, don't we? Lord, I know you're in the boat with me, but are you sleeping? <laughs> Come on, wake up, God. And that's what the disciples were experiencing in a very real way. It felt like their boat was going to sink and it was going down. And after they woke Jesus, Jesus, it, it says, calmed the wind and the wave instantly. And they wondered in their heart, what manner of man is this? But Jesus turned and he said, oh, you have little faith. Do you still have so little faith? Well, what's the message in that passage? I believe that the message in that passage is that we're to learn how to be calm just because Jesus is in the boat with us. We're to learn to be at peace just because Jesus is with us. Being in the presence of Jesus is what brings our peace. The calming of the storm is great, and I believe it's God's will to calm the storm. But the calming of the storm doesn't bring peace because there's another one waiting. You've either just come out of one, you're going into one, or you're going into another one. Welcome to life. In this life, you will have trouble. But the ability to know that Jesus is in the boat with me the ability to know that I can have the gift of Jesus' peace. Not just peace with God, but the peace of God at work in this situation. That's incredible. And that's an evidence of the Holy Spirit at work within our lives. 
The word comforter relates directly to peace. The Amplified Bible uh, reads John 14, 16 this way, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby, that He may remain with you forever. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is the presence of peace and the other fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, within our lives. And it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can unwrap this gift of peace, this gift of calm, this gift of assurance every day of our lives. Every day of our lives by understanding these two gifts of peace that God gave us. The gift of peace with Him. I don't have to run and hide. I don't have to be afraid. I can come boldly before His throne and make my request known. The gift of peace with God. And second of all, the the gift of the peace of God that is Jesus' own peace. The very same peace Jesus displayed in His life is our peace. So let's conclude it. First of all, we got to make peace with God trusting the finished work of Jesus. I mean really trusting the finished work of Jesus. (laughs) I mean really trusting the finished work of Jesus. Jesus paid for it all. Jesus paid the bill. And reconciled us to God. Make peace with God through trusting the finished work of Jesus. Next, we have to believe that Jesus Himself is my peace. This is a true tangible gift for us in this world. This isn't just some lofty doctrine or some idea to come to church to hear about. Jesus Himself is my peace. He's in the boat with me. And I can experience calm in the midst of any storm. No matter how demonically empowered it might be, by the grace of God, I can experience the peace of God within my life. Amen? The very same peace Jesus had. And then number three, we need to abide in the Holy Spirit. Don't make excuses, make time. That's worth repeating. We need to abide in the Holy Spirit. Don't make excuses, make time. This is an evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence. Spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, fasting, solitude, are essential. Again, we can self-justify a lot, but let's get real for just a minute. When you're not spending time in the Word, do you struggle? When you're not spending time in prayer, do you struggle? When you're not getting away with God a little bit, do you struggle? I know He's in the boat with you. I know He's with you. We've already said that. But the evidence of His presence is only going to be experienced through abiding. The evidence of His presence is only going to be experienced through abiding. And there is any number of reasons that we have not to abide. We all work. We all got family. We all got health things. We all got financial things. We all got people that want a piece of us and want a piece of our time and want this. Guess what? It's been that way from the beginning. We got to quit making excuses. This is the teeth in this message. We got to quit making excuses and we got to start making time for Jesus. Making time for Jesus. And that's what will bring the evidence of his presence. The materialization of peace must be unwrapped by faith and realized through obedience. The materialization of this peace, the presence of God's peace, must be unwrapped by faith and realized by obedience. As the old song says, trust and obey for there's no other way. Amen? Obedience matters. Just because Jesus paid it all. See, I think this is why a lot of people lack peace, and and we're done, but let me just conclude with this thought. I think a lot of people lack peace, and we could probably put ourselves in that bucket sometimes because we're trusting the grace of God without being obedient to God. And you're not going to be in peace in that situation. It's just not going to happen. Now, you may be completely at peace with God because of the grace of Jesus has settled that account. You're at peace with God through the blood of Jesus, but you're not going to be at peace in this world if you're not being obedient to Jesus. 